Today we are here with lover of poker, crusher of life, Matt Affleck. How's things going? Going well. Did you have fun at the World Series this year? I had fun at the World Series. Happy, you know, ready for a nice vacation, but yeah, had fun at the World Series. He's bluffing. I can look and tell. <laughs> I think you had some pain. Did you have some pain? No, I made money. I made money. Oh, well, good. What I, more I, I do you want? I made a little bit of money, but it's, it's, it's a long ride. I, I waved the white flag a little earlier than others. Some of these, now they have like 10 events after the main event. I was, I was over it. There are a lot of tournaments at the World Series after the main event. I showed up. The first time I played was like three days before the main event. So I, I just skipped the whole beginning. It's not the worst strategy because everyone now just is over it and they're just punting off all their chips and stuff. They, and I would be, I, I did the same in the end of one tournament. And I just said, all right, that's done. I can't play anymore. <laughs> it's, a, it's tough to show up and play for like, whatever, 70 days or something straight in high stakes tournaments, battling, flipping, yeah, trying yeah. to have a reasonable life. It's tough. But uh, yeah, I think, I think the play may be to come in the middle or the end because everybody's over it, but I'm still, I'm like happy to be here. Yeah, and there was a lot of, like, really good no limit tournaments towards the end. I think it's more like I'm going to focus on next year scheduling, like pacing myself to be towards the end of the series fresher mm -hmm. because there's a lot of – everyone's trying really hard at the beginning. <laughs> towards the end, they're just trying yeah. to get even. No, towards the end, yeah. it's it's uh, Towards the end is where the real value is, and there's a lot of uh, flinging of chips around the room. That's for sure true. All right, let's take a look at a hand where you decide to fling some chips into the pot. Yeah. We are deep in the, what is this, a Millionaire Maker? This is the Millionaire Maker. There's like 70 left. This is like my third straight top 100 finish in the big weekend fields. Oh, my goodness. Well, give everybody one tip to make deep runs in the big weekend fields that have 10,000 people in the tournaments. Play the same you would in every other spot. There you go. Play, good, play good poker. <laughs> and the nice thing about these tournaments with a ton of people is there are going to be a lot of bad players who yeah. are just blundering left and right and you just sit there play well and you win yeah a lot of people ask me that same question like well how do you go deep in these terms just like i don't do anything different it's just you shouldn't study your strategies and then implement your strategies and don't try to like especially for like the main event and stuff don't just play good poker and don't change your strategy and make too many adjustments i just made a video with james romero and he said literally the exact same thing just play regular that's it. All right, you raise up with the queen nine of spades, certainly fine and standard from the low jack seat, about 35 big blinds deep. Folds around to Nick Marchington. I don't know anything about his game. I don't know a lot about him. I know he's a British pro that I think is mostly cash game player, but, I mean, he finally was able the main event a couple years ago and plays tournaments now. Probably pretty good. He, I'm assuming he's good. <laughs> All right. At least knows what he's doing for sure. All right. He calls the big blind. Flop comes 10, 10, 4, two diamonds. You have the queen nine of spades. He checks. Probably want to put a little sprinkle in there. Yeah, so it's just range bet for me. Um, I think it's really important to remember preflop ranges here. And so how I always like to think about my low jack ranges is I'm opening all the offsuit 10s and suited 8s. Slow down. All the offsuit 10s, what does that mean? So that means jack 10 off, queen 10 off, king 10 off. The reasonable off. ones. Not 10-3 not off. Correct. No, the so, reasonable 10s. Yeah, when I say offsuit 10s, it means 10 is the lowest card there you in go. the hand. And so um, that's really good now where this board would be much different if it was 9-9-4 because I don't have queen 9 off, 10 9 off, jack 9 off. Um, I still have the suited ones, but we're more concerned about offsuit hands because there's more combinations of offsuit hands and those make up a majority of our hands. Sure. And he has some 10s as well. He'll have a lot of 10s, probably like 10-8 off. I don't know if he's folding 10-7 off. Potentially there's 70 left out of, you know, 8,000. So there's some ICM implications. But um, he's definitely going to have some 10s, but he doesn't have many pairs of 4s. Like, he's folding 9, 4, 6, you know, 7, 4, 8, 4, all the, the, the really trash 4x hands. So this is a flop I'm going to bet 100% of the time for a really small size. It is worth noting you say he should do these things. And, of course, Nick's a good, strong player. We presume most people are going to play reasonably pre-flop if they are known to be decent poker players, right? Yeah. They may be slightly off one or two little pips, but not too far off. Yeah, so like approaching these things, like you have to have a baseline to work for. Cause I tend to like focus on my own strategies because I think people overestimate their ability to understand other people's strategies. And so until you have like concrete information, um, I focus a lot more just on my like baselines and my strategies and the very easy adjustments rather than trying to make these crazy assumptions about people that we don't know. Sure. All right, so you do put a small bet out of 80K. Nice spot to bet frequently, and small, I think. He calls, turns a 10 of clubs. And this is where I think after he checks, a lot of people get really afraid to bluff because they think, well, he could have quads. 
Yeah. So he probably he can still have some ten X. He's gonna check raise a lot of tens on the flop, but like he's still gonna have like ten deuce, ten three, ten five suited. All it is, suited it is worth noting you would bet all of your tens, but he would check raise a lot of his tens. Correct. So therefore he's missing a lot of those tens in his range. Yeah. And he would check raise tens, some flush draw, some junky draw, like, you know, whatever. Queen yeah. queen nine or something. Those are all hands that he may want to check raise with on the flop. And when he does not check raise, he's missing those hands. Yep, so it's important to remember, like, I retain all of my 10s, and he only retains maybe, like, 20% of his 10s or whatever, you know, he's not check-raising on the flop. So even if he did have more 10s than you pre-flop, he now has proportionally fewer once we get to this point. Correct. And even, like, on the flop, he might have more combinations of 10s, but I still have a 10 more often just because mm -hmm. my range is so much tighter pre-flop raising from the low jack. I'm playing somewhere around, like, 23% of hands, and he's probably playing... 50% of hands. Right, so you don't have like 8-7 offsuit and stuff. Correct. So he has a lot more just garbage. Yeah. And, yeah, okay. You all get it. All right. So you are actually in a pretty reasonable spot in this hand because you have a decent number of 10s and you also have aces, kings, queens, jacks, nines, eights. Yep. And all these hands can easily go for value. Yeah, so a lot of his range now is going to be like so some flush draws, some hands with like the ace of diamonds in it, a lot of pair of fours. And here on the turn, I think like, the first thing just to think of in position is just what are my value bets? And that's always kind of the, everything from poker derives from value. And I think here, like, it's probably pretty simple. Just if you have pocket fives or better, um, a lot of his, his most common hand is going to be a pair of fours here. So it's always kind of a, important to think of what's the most likely hand they have. Yes, he can have a tens. Yes, he can have pocket sevens, pocket eights. But, like, the most common hand he's going to have is a pair of fours. So, like, pocket fives are better. Probably can just go for pure value here and that's a lot of value and because we have a lot of value we have to find a lot of bluffs yeah and uh this hand might look like it's not a good one because we don't have um any suit interaction with the board but other after like having a diamond in our hand would be good to like you know we kind of want to block is like ace jack of diamonds that are probably going to still call um the turn but like the worst suit to bet with is hearts so we don't want to have a heart in our hand because we want him to... He's going to have stuff like king-queen of hearts, king-jack of hearts, you know, maybe queen-jack of hearts, nine-eight of hearts maybe, that like these three to a straight, three to a flush hands. We want to... Those hands are just going to snap fold. So we don't want to have a card in our hand that prevents him from having one of those hands that just takes him a half a second and folds the turn to our bet. So spades are really good because he basically never has spades in his hand here. He always has diamonds and hearts most of the time. Okay. And, I mean, the nice thing about this hand too is that if he does happen to have a four... Sometimes you spike a queen or a nine. Exactly. So having two overcards to the four is really good here. We also get folds from, like, king-queen here. You know, ace-queen might fold here. Uh, Ace-nine might fold. will probably fold here. So we, we kind of clean up our equity a bit here on the turn. So would we... Like, what are we not betting here? So we're not betting value hands worse than a four, essentially, right? Correct. Hands that have some showdown value. So that would be hands like ace-high. Probably yeah. not betting a lot of ace-highs here. Yeah, I think the easy way is just kind of bet from the bottom up here. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned that offsuit tens was the bottom of our opening range. So we have like jacks, and those hands are quads, so those aren't bluffs. So like the easy way to think about it is now like what are our worst jacks? So probably like queen jack offsuit, maybe king jack offsuit bluffs, and then we're opening like suited eights and suited nines. So like hands like jack eight suited, jack nine suited, this hand queen nine suited. We're just nine we're just suited. working our way up, right? Yeah, start so it's at the kind bottom, of, work your way up. In positions a lot easier to play than out of position. So it's literally you can just kind of work your way up until you reach, It's you'll never know in game like, oh, how many combinations of bluffs, but you just kind of work your way up until you're like, yeah, that's kind of enough bluffs. <laughs> yeah, and I would think something like queen high-ish and worse yeah. probably wants to bluff. Maybe king, king high and ace high mostly want to check. Yeah, exactly. Under pair, maybe like threes and twos want to check. Yep. And then go from there. All right, so we are going to bluff. And I think now because we are betting relatively polarized, we're going to want to start betting bigger. Yeah, I think right. we can bet reasonably big here just because we have a big advantage on this board. We can we want us to start piling in a lot of money with a lot of our value hands. All right, so you go 320, and this is an interesting size. I I think I would have gone a little bit bigger to set up a river shot. Yeah, I probably should have gone a little bit bigger to make the river. I probably should have gone geometric sizing, which is betting equal percentages of the pot on the turn in the river. So if we take that bet back, we can see so the pot was 500,000. We have about two million, so if it's four SPR, we could bet pot on the turn and pot on the river. Four is a really key number. So if we bet 500k on the turn here, it'll be 1.5 in the middle, and we have 1.5. So we're betting 100%, 100%. Yeah, I think that 
probably works out a little bit better because it just applies more pressure to the fours. Maybe gets a little bit more folds from like random ace high. Yeah. Every time. Geometric always most in most situations it ends up being the best bet size because it maximizes the value. He's gonna have some hands that like call the turn and fold the river, some hands that are gonna call call, some hands that are gonna fold now. It's like it maximizes across all those different lines. Alright. He calls you. Okay, so now he probably has a lot of full houses and better. Yeah, he pretty much just has a four, quads, and then like some pocket fives, pocket sixes pocket sevens depending on what pocket pairs he just doesn't three bet and check raise on the flop this is where it gets tough because going to the river we know he has a full house <laughs> so do yes. you try to bluff someone off of a full house deep in a tournament so this would be a spot against like a like a recreational player that is i like to think they think about their hands in terms of the absolute value full house is good yes rather than the <laughs> relative value where like a four here is not very good yeah like oh my god i have a bad bluff catcher so this is a spot here versus like a wreck i might actually have zero bluffs and i would just shove mostly uh but again for value yes yeah and then against a player like nick who i'm assuming is pretty well studied um i'm gonna be a lot more like balanced here and potentially even over bluff here because this is a board i don't think it's triple barreled very much the people are kind of scared to try to bluff people off of full houses here it's scary to bluff someone off a of full house yes people don't like to fold full houses so here we are pots 1.1 you have 1.6 interesting stack to pot ratio yeah so this is kind of a mistake of the turn sizing a little bit well i would naturally think here you probably just want to be shoving or checking anyway because either you're shoving good full houses or some bluffs. Yep, 100%. I mean, I don't think you want to be going for thin value with, like, pocket fives at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, So it's it, it's definitely a shove or check uh, spot. I agree with that. So what, what's our best bluffing hands to bluff with in this spot? Well, when you structure your hands on the turn the way we were talking about from the bottom up, now it makes it a lot easier because we mentioned the bottom of our hands were, like, suited eights. So jack eight suited, queen eight suited, king eight suited. And now, eight on the river, those hands improve. So now our worst hands are, like, nines. So, like... Our worst hands are actually like jack nine and queen nine. And the jack nine and queen nine are actually really good because they kind of, they block the 10 nine offsuit, the queen nine off or queen 10 offsuit. So we kind of double block his offsuit tens, which is good. So do we rip it in or do we get fancy? Um, there are merits I to should. both because ripping it in gets more folds from the fours, but, but going smaller allows you to not be broke when he calls you. That, and I think going smaller, too, potentially allows for a bigger mistake from the opponent because it allows more opportunity to overfold. Hmm. Okay. So when I bet smaller, he has to call more often. But sometimes, some people, the bet size doesn't matter. When you get into a, like an absolute like yes or no scenario, sometimes the bet size doesn't matter and they, they make a mistake to overfold too much on the river to smaller sizings. And any bet here is going to feel big. Like, my range is pretty face up no matter what. And so, um, yeah, one thing that went through my head in, in game, I don't know how relevant it is, is I didn't know if he thought I would go all in here with like pocket nines or pocket jacks, which I would have. And so if he doesn't think I'm going all in with the over pairs and I just have quads or better, it reduces the amount I can bluff. So, sure. um, but yeah, I think I should just rip it in here and, um, put them in the blender and hope you don't get snapped and then. Instead, you put him in half of a blender. Yeah, we bet like <laughs> two-thirds pot. Um, probably should be shoving, but it, yeah, it's kind of the yes or no question here, and maybe it, I get a mistake. It's hard to know. Cold. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's really difficult, I and mean, we, could, we could get Nick in here. Nick, what do you think? <laughs> he said he was calling either way, so it didn't make a difference. He saved 800K. But you never really know what's right here. In spots like this, you mentioned it earlier, I just try to play close to GTO and not really worry about exactly what my opponent may be thinking because i don't know yep. i just don't know and i'm sure some people drastically overfold 800k i'm sure some people drastically overcall for a shove i just don't know what most people do because we never get to the river against people we randomly play against right yep so anyway you bet 800k he tanks and tanks and tanks and tanks yep. and tanks and has two seconds left on the clock and then calls with pocket sixes pocket sixes you know, pocket sixes may just find a hero call anyway for all the money. It might. It's supposed to call some. Um, he's supposed to fold, like, all his fours, basically, and just call with, like, five, sixes, sevens, and, like, tens. 
essentially. So maybe you saved 800K. I might have, yeah. Or uh, maybe you cost yourself the whole pot. Yeah, I might have cost myself the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know. And, uh, well, you can try again next year. Just keep winning all the weekend tournaments. Maybe, yep. you know, maybe you should only play the weekend tournaments and just forget everything else. Yep. Not a bad strategy. There you go. That's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me at pokercoaching.com. There you go. Matt hosts amazing webinars every week. It's every week, right? Yes. Pretty much. You get in there, you grind it out. You are one of the favorite coaches on pokercoaching.com. <laughs> You show people how to actually study and learn and improve their skills. Good job. Thank you. They love you. If you enjoy Matt Affleck's content, let us know in the comment section down there below. Click the like and subscribe button and the notification bell. We have lots more good content coming for you. Good luck. Have fun. Sometimes your bluffs are going to fail. It's okay. And it's okay. <laughs>